say 10 neurosurgeons. Mm -hmm. Visa, the, the, the cost the of getting cost that of neurosurgeon will go high. Yeah, yes, very high. Actually. Very high. And it's already high in the It's country. very high. I mean, 50 million people want to see 10 people. What do you expect? Mm -hmm. Their pricing will go high. Mm -hmm. So we need to consciously invest in training more subspecialties mm -hmm. and specialties. Then, of course, as you go now, is the inputs into healthcare system. So uh, there's the infrastructure, there's the medical equipment, then there's a the personnel, then there's the medicine. Mm -hmm. So the medicine control, can mm -hmm. we be able to cap our margins on pharmaceutical supplies and non-pharmaceutical supplies? Mm -hmm. Today, 98% of what we use in healthcare system is imported. Who said we cannot generate our own and produce our own? We import medical fluids, normal saline, which is water and so sodium chloride salt. We, in import. A, in a base, we import that. From as far as China, um, our syringes, uh, our pharmaceuticals, uh, mm. basic panas, parasit, panadol and paracetamols and cetrizines, and these are things which can be able to produce locally. Mm. So the government also needs to look at the taxation regime mm. for healthcare inputs. Mm. Today we pay VAT on medical equipment, something that was not there when I entered this, this, this industry. Mm. That naturally is transferred to the patient. So for example, if you're going to bring in a PET scan uh, with a cyclotron, you're going to use about three, $3.5 million or $5 million. Wow. Add, let's say, 16%, it is a cost you incur. That pushes it further. Mm. So for you as the person who has put that infrastructure, either you've borrowed or something, you need to repay. Mm. How do you do that? You transfer the cost to the user. Mm. And so those are the things we need to also relook at. Let's look at the doctor-patient ratio. Yes. Because a couple of years back, you were in government. Yep. And you bear me witness that you are not enough doctors. For sure. Then you transited to the county governments. The same, same issue. Yep. You're in the private sector. We are still having the same, same issue. And the government, what has, the government has done is sometimes it hires doctors from outside. Yet, we have doctors who each and every day we see K KMPDU and other association and organs talking about the shortage of doctors, yet we are here, we are not absorbing us. How do we sort out that in the country? I don't know the discussions that led to us importing doctors. I don't know what factors were there, and I'll probably not speak for that. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I've, I've learned that various reasons lead to various decisions. So I'm not <laughs> in the right place to talk about that. Even politics. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, yeah. But today it's very sad mm. that we are graduating about a thousand doctors every year and they're jobless. A thousand doctors each every and year. every year. Yes, and we have doctors seated at home. Mm. I think uh, the new government really needs to look into this. Because if you deploy these people... Today they're sitting at home doing nothing. And mm. do you know it's the government that has invested in them to be trained? Because there's a government contribution to the universities that trains these doctors. Mm. Otherwise, if doctors were to pay the full spectrum of their school fees, probably medical training would probably be two million shillings a, a year. But Whoa. I think regular students pay probably about 90 something thousand, I think. Mm. So it's substantially subsidized by the government. So it's only fair that the government's mm. investment in this section mm. rips back to the same population. Mm. And the moment we look at health sector as an economic tool, then that's the moment we start thriving. Mm -hmm. They say a healthy nation is a, is a wealthy nation. Is a wealthy nation. Mm -hmm. You get me? Mm -hmm. So, unfortunately, some people look at healthcare as a consumption point as opposed to a production point. Mm -hmm. The moment a member of my family is sick in the hospital, my productivity at work is reduced by 50%, whether I'm there physically or not, and everyone else that is attached to this particular patient. So productivity levels go down substantially when people are sick. Mm -hmm. So we need to make, it's, it's the same thing when you're running a business. There are things that necessarily do not <coughs> give you that investment directly, but they impact your production in other sectors. Mm -hmm. So we need to start looking and consciously as a nation to look at health sector as an investment point. When we look for investors to bring foreign direct investment, we also look at our health sector as an investment. First and foremost, it's unemployment. It's one of the top five employment sectors in the nation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. From nurses, health sector is multi-diverse. For example, if you run a hospital, you have nurses, you have doctors, you have cleaners, you have drivers, uh, you have porters, mm -hmm. you have your telecommunication uh, people, yeah, the lab you have a pub, uh, yeah. lab techs, you have yeah. pharmacists, you mm -hmm. have a public relations person. I mean, health sector has the IT sector of it. It has every industry incorporated into it and so even just having a robust health sector and that's what has worked for India mm. and today Turkey is working very hard 
to become a medical tourism sector. Jordan, for example, mm -hmm. a lot of Middle East countries have realized that health sector is one of their key pillars to their economy, mm -hmm. and they are not taking it for granted. Mm -hmm. And I hope and believe that Kenya should be that particular nation for Africa mm -hmm. as a center for medical excellence and medical investment. Of course, we will look at um, <coughs> the maternal health because I do remember back uh, when uh, the when uh, uh, President um, Uhuru took over, his wife started the Beyond Zero campaign so as to minimize the, the maternal, maternal deaths that we have in the country. Yeah. But before we go there, where are you? Because now you are in the private sector yeah. and the healthcare system in, in the country, when you go to the private, they are quite expensive. Um, in your institution, RFH, yes. what exactly are you doing to maybe bridge that gap because private hospitals are quite expensive um public hospitals have their challenges as well mm -hmm. and now the, the, the maybe that you can even the ground um the idea that private hospitals are expensive mm -hmm. should change why am i saying this mm -hmm. without mentioning names our perception of private hospitals remain a select few private hospitals but that's not the case. As RFH, we are the first particular facilities to accept contract category B for NHIF at that point. B is comprehensive. So comprehensive means if you have an NHIF cover, you'd walk in, get services, and walk out, which was mostly taken by public hospitals and faith-based mission hospitals. And that's why mission hospitals became very popular. Mm -hmm. But we showed and, and proved that you can have that pricing level and still be sustainable because we're all looking at sustainability. Mm -hmm. There's no point I open my doors today, you all walk in and tomorrow I've shut down with suppliers not paid and staff not paid. So you need to ensure that the engine keeps running. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we currently look at what is the average cost of providing a service to a patient. If you walk in, there's a cost we have to incur. Mm -hmm. I have to pay the doctor, I have to mm -hmm. buy the medicine, I have to pay the lab reagents. What is that cost? Today, the average cost of service provision for an outpatient facility would probably be about 3,000 shillings. That is true. That is from consultation mm. to, to medicine to lab, mm. and, 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 you, and you go. Mm -hmm. 3,000. That mm. is a cost in card. Mm -hmm. So if you pay anything less, then you also start questioning what is the quality of what I'm getting. Because mm -hmm. then again, we can have medicine that is 50 shillings, but it's not... You understand? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so, so what is that cost? So mm -hmm. what we are doing as a, as a private sector, <coughs> I, would look, I would wish we look at an NHS model that mm -hmm. is used in UK, mm -hmm. whereby you offer same pricing across board, mm -hmm. and now people compete on the quality of service provision. Mm -hmm. So that you make the decision that if I go here, mm -hmm. I'll get better services than if I go here. So that people compete on quality, but the reimbursement is the same. Mm -hmm. If you want to go to very high end, then now you're going because you're looking at your own luxury. The same way there's a hotel that will charge you 3,000 shillings, mm -hmm. bed and breakfast, and another one will charge you 80,000 shillings, bed and breakfast. Mm -hmm. But the bare minimum is, can we concentrate on the core service point, which is health service provision? Mm -hmm. I am in pain, I need to walk out without feeling painful. What is involved to do that? So that cost is constant, whether it's in public or private. The difference is, in public, of course, the human resource is paid for by the exchequer. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yeah. They're probably not paying rent. These are inputs. But don't say they're not paying. It's being paid for by someone. And that's where the taxation comes in. And we pay tax and the exchequer pays for them. Mm -hmm. But even these facilities need to be sustainable. We have seen institutions complain uh, that their facility improvement fund, which is, even if you go to public hospital, you still pay a certain fee. Mm -hmm. But this fee now was going into the CRM, I don't know what they call that account, which is a central account, and mm -hmm. then we hope it comes back, which was never the case, and hindered service provision. The facilities need to ring fence that money, which is their FIF field, fees, so that they are able to also continue operating. Mm -hmm. So what happens is my desire for a healthy nation uh, is you look at a place where private and public is reimbursed equally, Mm -hmm. and they compete on service. So if the public sector will have an advantage because they're not paying salaries and rent, that means they have extra revenue. And that means they can be better. You understand? Mm -hmm. Because a stable public health system mm -hmm. is better for all of us. Me included. Because my mother in the village doesn't have my branch anywhere next to her. Mm -hmm. My grandmother down there uh, doesn't have 
a private hospital next to her. And even if it's there, she probably would not be able to access. Mm -hmm. So we need a robust public sector, and that increases the investment of health sector across. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, let's look at the maternal health now, because as I had alluded to earlier, is that the Beyond Zero campaign and the, 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 the small, small hospitals, which I would say they are a game changer when it comes to the cases of maternal death. The maternal deaths have really reduced over the years. And more, more could be done? Do you believe more should be yep. done? I think we have, I mean, it's not always gloom. We have done very well as a nation in mm -hmm. health sector. From when the National Hospital Insurance Fund just used to pay, Kenyans used to call it bed charge, but it was a rebate. Mm. And now they can afford uh, dialysis. I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of people in Kenya today who would go for dialysis. These are families who probably would have given up and have died. Mm. Because 9,500 twice a week for the rest of your life is not, oh. it's not cheap. Yeah. But now we've been able to make these people affordable. If there's an institution we need to protect with everything we have mm. is the National Hospital Insurance Fund. Because it's the backbone of this nation that we have no idea about. Mm -hmm. It protects every family. It makes all of us have that basic provision. Because you provide food and provide health, then everything falls in place. Mm -hmm. um, so as, as we increase the, that increased investments in health sector, and so with that also, as we talk of, you have just, just before this, I saw you were talking about religious, mm -hmm. there also need to be improved regulations into this sector so that we also mm -hmm. don't have mushrooming things that are not well much regulated. Yeah. So once you have that, then mm -hmm. you have access uh, to skilled delivery services. Mm -hmm. And that is what has led to our reduction in maternal mortality. Because today, our, our, our access to skilled labor uh, midwives is much higher than it was before. Mm -hmm. Kenyans know that I will not deliver at home. I need to deliver into an institution. And those institutions, of course, we had Linda Mama, which came in mm. and has really helped women yeah, to access. Uh, because at the end of the day, it comes back to what am I going to do out of pocket expenditure? Mm. And those out of pocket expenditure is what leads to catastrophic uh, uh, expenditure in health service uh -huh. uh, access, yes. Yeah, that, that's an interesting way of uh, looking at it. And a quarter, more, less than a quarter of Kenyans can amply access health care here in the country most of the kenyans cannot access quality health care and that's where you guys come in but uh, uh, looking at even how the technology itself has changed you've mentioned of not more or less regulating but we need to have some control to look at some controls yes more or less like the way if you want a, a, a cab service you just go to your phone and get one of the uh, one of the uh, of the companies yes. there and i've seen that also happen you, you can medicine. contact a doctor via an app yeah. and uh, you'll be told telemedicine, exactly right. telemedicine yes. touch on that here in the country kenya has made some strides in terms yeah. of the digitization kenya is a digital uh, it's called a Silicon Savannah of, of yeah. Africa, you yeah. know. Yeah. I mean, we are very, uh, our Nigerian brothers are doing much better, but I think we have also done very well. Mm -hmm. um, you cannot run away from the fact that as we advance in technology, mm -hmm. everybody is looking for convenience, and you cannot run away from that. So that convenience, because life has become difficult, I'm sure you're feeling it, I'm feeling it, everyone yes. is feeling it. Yes. And the whole world is going through a recession. So I need to be more productive by going to work mm -hmm. and not queuing in a hospital for hours to be treated. So if I can be able to access that service at the comfort of my home, then so be it. And so more people are, 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 are going much more into telemedicine mm -hmm. uh, because of that convenience. I can be able to order medicine from my phone. And so we just need to to be able to now structure regulations. Mm. Usually what happens is uh, disruptions come in the absence of regulation. But that's a good thing, but then later after that, we need to have regulations to control them. When M-Pesa came in, there was no regulation in mobile money transfer. Then we created the laws later after. Mm. So we need to, our, our parliament needs to start thinking, mm. what are the controls towards telemedicine? We've also had issues where I think home care and all these other things, who is that person who gives the home care? How regulated are they? We, we cannot run away from it. It is an area that will keep growing every single day. We just need to now accept that it's there and put rules and regulations to be able to govern it. So that every Kenyan who goes to that application knows it's a credible application. It is run by credible people so that we also don't have somebody who's not trained on the other side just telling you things and we fall for it. Then tomorrow we start having more 
of demerits than merits of that particular growth. Uh, before, be, before we wrap up, you'll tell us about uh, your views on the health commission in the country and maybe we should have done that a long time ago. But before then, uh, the head of state yesterday did launch what was called now a cyber knife uh, technology. This, from what I've been able, the little I've been able to gather, yeah. is that it's quite a game changer when it comes to cancer treatment in the, in the country. Kindly share some, some light on that. I will give a personal ex experience. I had a friend who was a doctor when I was an intern in Kiambu mm -hmm. District Hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day when I'm sitting in the house, he sends me a, a message that five by five by five. What does that mean? He had just done a CT scan, fell down during a surgery he was conducting. Oh. Then he had these persistent headaches. He was taken for a CT scan. They got a mass on his mm -hmm. pituitary gland. Mm -hmm. So if you know what a pituitary gland is a pituitary hypothalamus in the, in the, in the, brain. In the brain yes it controls almost all your endocrine neuron uh, hormonal system most of it mm -hmm. so it's a very sensitive place that you cannot go open and touch he was flown to india it was touched and seven weeks later we buried him sadly oh. as it is so what am i trying to say mm -hmm. cyber knife comes to sort some of these things there are tumors in very sensitive places that you cannot open because when you open you cause more damage than mm -hmm. solution. Mm -hmm. So it is very precise. In the layman's uh, uh, language, there's a, there's a tube which has an X-ray head, for lack of a better word. Uh, but basically, it's a linear accelerator. It's a radiotherapy mm -hmm. treatment. So we have the linear accelerators where you lie in and, and it's controlled. But the problem is we realize there were more effects when it burns. It's like literally burns the, cu the tumor cells. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it burns even the good cells. And so that causes more side effects. Mm -hmm. So when you get such sensitive areas, you know, the pancreas, the brain, mm -hmm. uh, the prostate, uh, the lungs, there's a, la there's a tumor somewhere there and you have to. So cyber knife literally is robotic. So there's a robotic arm with a head that mm. goes and directs those radiation rays to that particular tumor and is able to kill the tumor cells. Mm -hmm. And so basically is now we are more precise in our treatment of cancer than we were before. Mm -hmm. Previously they would do surgery, remove, then they take you through serious uh, cobalt radiation that burns almost every cell there. Mm -hmm. And you realize that most people then would say if you have cancer and you go for treatment, mm -hmm. it's like you're, you're, you're already judged to die. Mm -hmm. So we are getting more technological advancement that are now making it more precise in treatment. And that's now what we have, and we are proud as a country to have that. You are saying this is the second it's one, the second one in, after the, Egypt, in the continent. In the continent. And uh, how is it that it's bringing the cost of, of, of health care down or cancer treatment down? And we always, every time we hear a new machine that do, does A, B, C, D, of course... It no, the comparative cost is if you're going to travel oh, from okay. Kenya to uh -huh. India, mm. you're going to spend two million. We now have it here and you're not going to have those costs. So it mm. has brought the cost down because mm. people would fly out to have that service. Mm. Now you don't need to fly out. You have it here within Nairobi. So what are the costs? When you're going to India, there are a lot of things. You have to go with a relative, a caregiver. You have to book a hostel or a hotel, stay there for so long, accommodation plus the cost of that service delivery. Mm -hmm. Now you don't have that. You can seek it from the convenience of your country. Mm -hmm. You understand? Get it uh, conveniently. And also, they have also subsidized the cost. Okay. And I believe there are plans that the government has to, to be able to cater for this entire cancer treatment uh, wholesome. Mm -hmm. And we can't wait for that to happen because most families mm -hmm. are actually impoverished because of cancer today. And cancer has come down uh, from being an elderly disease to even as early as 25 years old, we're having people having cancer. Mm -hmm. It's insane. Tell us about your health institution, you, how you started it and how it has been a game changer because I can attest because I have some I have a relative who lives almost uh, close to one of one, the centers yeah. and we one time he had an emergency and your center is one of the places that he sought help first. Uh, first, uh, I want to say I want to th support to really thank Kenyans who have stood by us. It's mm -hmm. not an easy thing. First of all, starting a business in this country and starting it as a young person. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I've gone through a lot of challenges as a person to be able to make RFH go where it is. But it's resilience, determination to know that you're doing something good for your nation. And I believe your reward is probably sometimes not here, but somebody somewhere else will be able to recognize. But I want to thank our patients who have voted for us. We are two years in a row. Mm -hmm. We are the facility of choice award by the Kenya Quality Healthcare Awards last year and mm -hmm. this year. We won that award in a row. And that tells us that we are doing something good and we keep doing it. Uh, it's work in progress. We keep growing. Uh, we, 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 we currently have nine outlets. We are opening mm -hmm. our 10th branch very soon. Okay. Uh, and so that's in uh, Ruaka. We are in uh, Kamakis, Ruiru, Komarok. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Ruai, we have two. So there's one which is a specialist branch that caters for all these. We have a neurosurgeon, yeah. a spinal the, surgeon. The, the Ruai one. Yes, the uh -huh. Ruai one. And then we have uh, Nyayo Estates, Yukimao. And we hope to have more coming in. Uh, our model is basically to be able to bring these costs within the national health, now it's called national health social National, National Social Health mm, Insurance, Insurance Fund, Fund yes. yes, that is the public. So basically it's how can we be able to access to as many Kenyans as possible. Mm. Within the same uh, lead time, you don't have to wait for probably, we have instances where people wait for more than 24 hours for a simple x-ray we should be able to have. And we ensure that most of our centers have at most most of the services that you'll need as mm. possible. And if it's not one, then we'll be able to refer you to our specialist branch that becomes our referral center. So basically it's a hub and spoke mechanism where we have the main hospital with satellite hospitals that are able to to, to take care of, we can be able to do caesarean sections, normal mm -hmm. surgeries, maternity services, mm -hmm. laboratory, pharmacy, dental, and all that within the packages that the government gives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. And uh, you tell us something, some of the challenges that you're experiencing. I'm asking this specifically because of some hospitals are claiming that NHIF is taking a very long time to actually pay up the bills. So it's proving to be a challenge. Just because of interest of time, allow me now to rope in Dr. Maxwell Okoth, who is the founder and group managing director at the Ruai Family Health Care Facilities. And as well, because of the interest of time, you won the People's Hospital of the Year Award again. What is it that you're doing right? Tell um, us the secret. Our tagline is uh, changing medicine, touching hearts. And what, what inspired us to come up with this is we just want to look at how health service is delivered. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a continuous work in progress, but uh, health service should be, the patient should be at the center of the service delivery. Mm -hmm. And so how your patients experience you mm -hmm. is how they become your advocates. And this is a public award whereby the, the, the public is the one that chooses who they think. And so uh, we were in a, with a panel with a number of about 10, 12 hospitals, faith-based, public, mission, uh, top tier, private hospitals. Mm -hmm. And it's just basically the people who have been there with you uh, scouting and vouching for you. Mm -hmm. So basically, is put your patient first, put your patient at the center of your service delivery and everything falls in place. And that's Congratulations like. for, for that second feat. Thank you very much. And hope that, that uh, you keep that fire burning. Now, there's something that I had asked you because before we go to the closing yeah. statement on the Health Service Commission. I would like to pick your mind on that, having worked in government, in county government, and now in pra private practice. I, I don't know the technicalities that involve, that are hindering health service commission. I still feel like either it's a political turf that makes it not achievable, uh, because everyone, we have sung about this song for the longest time. Mm. Uh, there could be intricacies in the political sector that makes it difficult for the counties to release staff back to the national government. Mm. Uh, there, it needs a lot of political goodwill, but it's something we really need to do if we are going to move forward within our health sector service. We, we can't run away from it. It's just a matter of time. At some point, something will have to give. Yeah. Uh, final closing, Max, in regards to your facility. And also, you're talking about a new facility, the 10th yep. one, as we wrap up. Fine. Thank you. First, I think we'll talk about what is happening in the country, and I'm sorry to diverse. No, no, as no, we no. look at what is happening in Skol Shakahola, mm -hmm. I think we need to be very, in, uh, very like intentional with mental health. I see a lot of mm -hmm. mental health issues uh, in Shakahola. It's a good thing you brought yes, it up. And, uh, mm -hmm. we will, let's not hide and bury our heads under the sun. There's a mental aspect to it. And mm. so we will do all the legal, political regulation, but if we don't tackle mental health for Kenyans today, we are going to see more of these things happening. I think there's a story of a lady in Kitangela and all mm. these things. I mean, these things don't just happen. Yeah, so yeah. there needs to be an intentional drive towards mental health. Mm. And I'm very cognizant of mental health issues because I know what it means, even at a personal level. Mm. Uh, we need to actually be very intentional to deal with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, 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 you retrieve someone who's about to die and says he's not ready to, to be saved. I mean, yeah. there are diseases. Yeah, and, and we are, we are seeing very learned people, <coughs> yes. people who have a lot of and wealth that they decide If you talk something. to most psychiatrists, mm -hmm. a lot of religion, uh, and this is not to be misconstrued, uh, some people hide under the religious blankets when they have mental issues. And so that's something that we need to address. But back to our discussion, mm -hmm. I think... Uh, uh, 
Yeah, you've asked about uh, facilities are struggling. It is a fact we are currently struggling. I would want to believe there are teething issues as things settle in place, but again, it cannot continue for so long because the situation is dire. We hope something will be done. Mm. Uh, but I want to choose hope. And I always say behind everything, there's always a silver lining mm -hmm. that will take us to the next step. And I believe all the intentional actions are being done to be able to ensure that every Kenyan accesses healthcare and it's affordable. For us as an institution, uh, we, we are looking at going towards the Kiambu road direction as well mm -hmm. as we look at other places as we move out of town mm -hmm. basically is just to create an infrastructure and eventually come up with a way that kenyans would be able to have affordable services mm -hmm. uh, uhc on with with or without uhc in place how can we be able to play our role to bring the cost of healthcare service down mm -hmm. by economies of scale and be able to leverage on that network that we have created over time it's a good thing that you're quite passionate about mental wellness of the country and you also offer these services right yes we do thank you so much dr maxwell Okoth, uh, laying a bear and putting things into perspective on affordable health care and maternal health care dr maxwell is the founder and group managing director or r f h or if you like why family health care indeed thank you so much for joining us Let's continue this conversation on social media. My name is Bentro Njue and Lucy Moura has been our sign language interpreter for this live show. I'm now giving the baton now to my colleague Khalid Abdullahi with Kurunzi Mashinani and Tamrini. Thank you so much and have a blessed afternoon. <laughs>